career in 1908 with an unsuccessful attempt at constructing a helicopter. After 30 years of intermittent speculations on the direct lift principle, his plans for a practical helicopter of his own design were carried to a successful conclusion. On the 6th of May, 1941, he was able to pilot this skinless predecessor of the XR-4 to a world's endurance record for this type of craft. He remained aloft for one hour, 32 minutes, and 26 seconds. It has been realized in four engine ships of the fixed wing type. The helicopter principle has never been far from Mr. Sikorsky's mind. The store helicopter is four centuries old. Our earliest existing record of the conception of its principle is to be found in the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. This simple sketch is so lacking in detail that it may leave one in doubt as to his purpose, but the accompanying notes are convincing. He writes, I say that this instrument, made with a helix, if well made, that is to say of flax and linen, of which one has closed the pores with starch, and is turned with great speed, the said helix is able to make a screw in the air and climb high. There is no evidence of da Vinci ever having made a model of his machine, but there have been others. In 1922, the Army Air Forces evidenced their first active interest in helicopter development by sponsoring the Russian-born engine of this huge craft at McCookfield, Ohio. During the captive flight stage of its development, we find its progress being observed by General William Mitchell, then Assistant Chief of the Air Forces. De Balthazard apparently had no time for scale models. His craft weighed 3,600 pounds and was powered by a 220 horsepower engine. His best efforts never got it beyond the reach of a six-foot man. In spite of its apparently erratic flight characteristics, it succeeded in exhibiting an encouraging amount of stability, but the results obtained were not striking enough to warrant continuing the project. One year after the de Bothazot machine had been abandoned, Emil Berliner was attempting to get this faltering craft into the air at College Park, Maryland. This was his third and most nearly successful model. The photographic evidence at hand would hardly support the popular belief that a third attempt is infallible. In Italy, Dascagno built this not ungraceful craft in 1930. Its record ceiling was 59 feet, distance 3,500 feet. With varying degrees of success, these and numerous other weird craft rose and fell in the headlines of aviation, each contributing something to this pioneer principle of mechanical flight. Two seemingly unsurmountable difficulties, proper control in the air, and the price paid in weight and power necessary for direct ascent, appeared to have permanently grounded the helicopter for all practical purposes. Meanwhile, the fixed-wing airplane was making great progress in the conquest of the air. As military and civil demands for speed and carrying ability were met and surpassed, it became evident, at last, that aviation was on the beam. The way was clear for the tremendous development which has followed. But with the fixed-wing principle, speed in the air means speed in landing and taking off. For sustaining altitude, speed must be maintained in crossing high mountains in bad visibility. With improved machines and the development of flying technique, accident rates were reduced encouragingly in proportion to the number of miles flown. But the fixed-wing airplane will always have certain limitations. A pilot will always have to be a more or less highly trained engineer. Literally thousands of square miles will have to be tied up in airports. Worst of all, when an accident does occur, the loss of life and material is too often total. Because of these facts, and in spite of continual discouragements, the direct lift principle of flight has persisted. It has not only persisted, but in light of recent developments, it is reasonable to believe that it may eventually play as important a role as its fixed wing predecessor. Had anyone suggested during this early period of development the possibility of the da Vinci principle of direct lift flight ever being realized, its pioneer inventor might well have been quietly amused. But for the past 35 years, aeronautical engineers have known that it was possible to lift a flying machine into the air by means of a propeller rotating in a horizontal plane. However, as recently as 1932, the world's record for helicopter free flight contained such decidedly impractical figures as 
distance one kilometer, duration about 10 minutes, altitude 18 meters. In that same year, Professor Heinrich Facke of the famed Facke Wolf aeronautical firm began work on a helicopter for the German government. His success was such that in the spring of 1938, his craft astonished the aeronautical world by making an exhibition flight inside the Deutschlandhalle in Berlin with Fräulein Hanna Rosch at the controls. This ship, of course, broke all existing helicopter records by a considerable margin. In fact, it has gone into the records as the first successful ship of its type. One of the greatest barriers in helicopter design has been torque reaction caused by the large rotor. This unusual tendency of the fuselage to rotate in the opposite direction to the rotor was arrested in the FW-61 by the employment of twin rotors placed side by side and turning in opposite directions. At the time when the FW-61 was establishing its success, practical comparison of its speed and lift were made with that of the autogyro. The various designers of the now successful helicopter must pay a tribute to the late Signor de la Sierva, who constructed and flew the first successful autogyro in 1925. The Cornu helicopter had succeeded in lifting itself a few feet above the ground as early as the year 1909, but no material progress was accomplished in the helicopter field until after the considerable amount of enthusiasm for autogyros had come and gone, bequeathing the helicopter much information of value. Somewhat similar in appearance, the principal difference between the autogyro and the helicopter is that the rotor of an autogyro is not power driven. While the autogyro obtains its lift from its rotor, the rotor serves only as a wing would serve a conventional aircraft. Its rotation is auto-rotation and is caused by the movement of the ship through the air. The autogyro achieves its motive power from a conventional engine and propeller. Its advantage over the fixed wing craft may also be considered its kinship to the helicopter. That is, the rotation of its blades makes it capable of sustained flight at low speed approximately 30 miles per hour. Extensive tests of the autogyro proved it to be at best a tricky ship to fly. It has, however, formed an interesting step between the now highly perfected fixed wing airplane and the direct lift helicopter. A few years ago, the U.S. Army Air Forces performed extensive tests on the autogyro, but the number of ships in the service has never exceeded 10. At the conclusion of these tests, the development of the helicopter had progressed so far that it was believed to have every advantage of the autogyro, plus many more of its own. In short, while the helicopter can hover, the autogyro is compelled to fly over 30 miles per hour in order to sustain altitude. An autogyro landing requires a glide angle and leveling off, hence more ground space than the 20-foot platform on which a helicopter can come gently to rest. While the rotor-type aircraft was found to be less efficient in power required than the fixed-wing aircraft, the compensating advantages of the helicopter were writing an important chapter in the long history of its evolution. Military secrecy has forbidden us any further knowledge of what, if any, progress the Germans have made with the FW-61 type of craft since the opening of the war. But developments in this country have centered principally around this very convincing Sikorsky model which our army has designated XR-4. This ship is unique in its single lifting rotor. Its directional control and torque reaction are very simply accounted for by the single control pitch small rotor at its tail. In a fixed wing airplane, the wing is a shape designed to lift and sustain the entire mechanism in the air. The wing can do this only when a considerable amount of air flows across it. In use, the practical arrangement is to move the wing through the air. Thus, the wing speed is the speed of the whole ship, and the speed of support can never be zero. Actually, the rotor blades in the helicopter may be considered as airfoils or wings. By revolving the rotor, its series of wings acquire a speed of approximately 350 miles per hour at their tips, and so deliver the required lift while the forward speed of the ship is still zero. In case of engine failure, auto rotation and freewheeling of the main rotor of any helicopter are of course essential features. If these were not present, 
the machine would fall like a stone when the engine stopped. As a helicopter glides to earth, it assumes the characteristics of an autogyro and may be landed accordingly. As the glide path is inclined, that is to say, as soon as the machine moves forward in its descent, the rate of descent in the glide is reduced. Under these circumstances, its reactions are similar to those of any slow-flying fixed-wing aircraft. A number of dead engine landings were deliberately and successfully executed by the XR-4 during its recent flight test. Lateral and longitudinal control are obtained in this ship by adjusting the pitch of the main rotor blades. It may be increased or decreased by the pilot at any desired point in their rotation with a compensating but opposite variation of pitch at 180 degrees. As the lift of a helicopter is not dependent on forward motion and as motion in any direction is affected by the main rotor, an adjustment of the blades by the pilot will tilt the ship sideways, forward or in any direction and so it will proceed in that manner, climbing, descending, or in level flight. As this control is actuated by the stick, and the pitch control of the small vertical air screw in the rear is operated by rudder pedals, the controls of this ship are not unlike those of a conventional fixed-wing aircraft except that they are quite sensitive and the tendency is to over control. Throttle operation has been simplified in that climb and descend by simultaneously increasing or decreasing the pitch of the main rotor blades together with the use of the throttle. Since an increase of rotor pitch requires more power to maintain the rotor at whatever RPM is desired, there is a synchronizing mechanism that opens the throttle as the pitch is increased and thus maintains nearly constant engine and rotor RPM despite pitch changes. While at this time the XR-4 stands unrivaled in successful performance in the helicopter field, the Platt LePage Aircraft Corporation at Ediston, Pennsylvania has been working under an Army Air Forces contract on a helicopter of their own design. This craft, with its twin rotors, bears a resemblance to the Focker Wolf model. While its military designation is XR-1, its development has been less progressive than the XR-4. It has, however, been flying with an encouraging amount of success since May 1941. Manufacturing names such as Kellett, Nash Kelvinator, and others are also becoming important figures in the Army Air Force's helicopter program. Competent authority believes that present knowledge is adequate to design and construct a successful helicopter of approximately 6,000 pounds gross weight of which a reasonable percentage should be useful load. Though high speed is not of first importance, it should exceed 100 miles per hour. Range and endurance are predicted to be such that it should make an extremely useful instrument in combating submarine warfare. A series of tests have been conducted by the Army in order to determine the ability of this new type craft to operate from a small landing deck which may be constructed on any seagoing vessel. As the weakest link in a chain determines its strength, so the slowest ship determines the speed of a convoy. Delay in assembling the varied units for a mass voyage, harbor congestion on arrival, and the employment of a naval escort are expensive items. In fact, so much is the convoy system a factor of cost and delay in the prosecution of an overseas military operation that any weapon which will permit greater freedom of action for cargo vessels will be of extreme value to our armed forces. It is believed that when a sufficient number of helicopters are available, ships of any size or speed equipped with small landing platforms may enjoy the individual and independent protection which the helicopter bids fair to offer against the undersea enemy of wartime shipping. The more comprehensive of two deep sea tests which have been conducted with helicopters operating from merchant vessels was made in July 1943 the findings of this voyage were encouraging to the point that it is believed that a helicopter can be operated from a deck of this sort in weather bad enough to prevent the launching of fixed wing ships from an aircraft carrier. Military and domestic prospects for the uses to which a helicopter may be put are unlimited. Equipped with low pressure floats, 
There are perhaps no more than two types of surface on which a helicopter cannot land and take off, dense forest and heavy sea. With the aid of a rope ladder and the helicopter's particular ability to control its position so precisely in space, even these circumstances should not be exceptions to its performance of many military missions hitherto impossible or extremely dangerous because of the limitations of high-speed aircraft. Because forward speed can be reduced to zero, zero visibility is practically the only condition which will ground the helicopter. A sharp-eyed helicopter pilot can literally feel his way through the air by flying around trees and over large obstacles. Colonel H.F. Gregory, who has been in charge of the Army's rotary wing aircraft program since 1936, believes that since the helicopter needs no prepared landing field, it may provide excellent liaison and cooperation with ground forces. Artillery fire may be coached by direct line telephone communication. For behind the line missions at night, this airplane should be a real threat. With no propeller and a muffled exhaust, it can operate in almost complete silence. It can transport personnel and critical material to inaccessible locations, rapidly evacuate wounded men near the front, and unreal communication wires behind advancing troops over rugged terrain. Having no wings, the helicopter is less likely to be detected in flight than in a conventional slow-flying airplane. Hovering stationary in the air, it will blend deceptively with the ground pattern below when properly camouflaged. In civil life also, this versatile vehicle will without doubt close many a link in the chain of practical aircraft operation. As with most post-war developments held out to the panting public, there will surely be a considerable interval of time before there is a helicopter on every roof and the two helicopter family makes its appearance. But there is no question that the superior control and maneuverability of the helicopter will elevate it to a major position in advancement of transportation facilities. These scenes show stages of one of the first demonstrations of the helicopter to the American public. Another example of manipulative control is staged by the VS-300, the first of the XR-4 type helicopters, by picking up a small ring on a nose extension while in flight. The ring is transported across the area and delivered to a spectator standing by. This exhibition took place on delivery of this Pioneer aircraft to the Ford Aeronautical Museum in Detroit. By way of diversion, Here's a helicopter's eye view of a helicopter taking off from the deck of a cargo ship. The normal oscillation of the helicopter is considerably exaggerated by the lens of the camera. Two of the rotary ships are operating from this vessel in an experimental flight. Note the action as seen from one helicopter hovering in the air while the second aircraft leaves the deck. As it sweeps out over the briny sea, the helicopter bearing the camera approaches the deck and lands. We need not further enumerate the probable uses to which this fourth dimension of flight may be applied. We can, however, pause to marvel at the fact that simple as its principle may now seem, it was conceived 400 years ago, and so must be accorded an unusually long period of legend among other principles of science. After all these years, it's good to know that at last the anxious mother's admonition to her pilot son namely to fly low and fly slowly, may now be obeyed. <laughs>